Well, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and I welcome you here at worship at Christ Church United Methodist in Charleston, West Virginia. We're glad those of you that are here joining us here in the Centrum and all of you that are joining us online this morning. Uh, if you are joining us online, we invite you to go to our website at ccumwv.org. And when you go there, you'll see a link where you can download a copy of the bulletin for our 11 o'clock service and, and follow in all the prayers and the liturgies and the lyrics to the hymns we'll be sharing this morning and I, I pray you find that. you also find more information about our church, including uh, some of the announcements I'll be sharing now. Uh, those of you that are here in the center, of course, in our little trifold, uh, we have a list of some of the activities that will be happening here uh, in the life of our church in the coming week. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, our youth and children's basketball program now is ongoing, connecting with other churches here in the Charleston area in the Church Youth League. And you'll see a listing of the games and where the, our teams will be playing this week and we invite you to go uh, kind of cheer on our young people if you have a chance and it's a great time to do that. Also we'll be blanketing the city in love. We're collecting uh, twin size sheets and blankets for our, our shelters here in the area and then the United Women of Faith are having a blanket party on Sunday January 29th at 4 p.m. where they'll be uh, working with fleece blankets and, and making tied fleece bank that they'll take to hospice and, and some of the nursing homes in our area. So we invite you to join us in that time of blanketing our town with our love uh, and a tangible blanket. Uh, you also see uh, Christ Church has always been a church that always wanted to be actively engaged in mission. It's part of our, our DNA. And you'll see listed here uh, in the bulletin a couple of uh, mission opportunities that are coming up. Uh, one of those is a Florida mission trip through our volunteers in mission. There will be a go team going down to, to work and help folks that are recovering from the hurricanes that hit down there. Uh, we invite you to follow up on that. Also, every year they send a, a mission team to Alaska. And so if you'd like to be a part of that volunteer and mission uh, program, there are things there. You can contact Kathy Cheney. Uh, and again, if you don't have her number, call the church office and we'll work on getting you connected. Uh, also, many of our other programs, uh, again, have kind of restarted after the Christmas break. And we invite you to join us for some of those studies. The Yarnets are getting together. Our committees are starting to meet again. And so you'll notice there's a meeting this week. And those of you that are on our committees, watch for additional information as we begin to set the schedule uh, for our meetings for the coming year. All that being said, though, what I'd like you to do now is center yourself here in the centrum, center yourself wherever you are, and let us join together in worshiping this God who calls to each and every one of us, saying, come and follow me. I'm Janet Flanagan, the liturgist for today, and I invite you to join me in the call to worship. In Jesus Christ, a light of hope shines brightly in all the world. May the light of Jesus Christ shine brightly upon us. May this light nourish and guide us. May Christ's light shine the pathway to a new life. Let us now worship in the joy of Christ's light shining brightly before us.
Please join me in the prayer of confession. O oh God, our many fears keep us distant from you and one another. We hear Jesus inviting us to follow and become fishers of people, yet we do not understand what this means for our lives. We do not easily leave behind the things that seem important to our own welfare. We do not easily reach out to people whom we think are different from us. We do not easily embrace the one who does not promise material or social rewards. Have mercy upon us. Empower us by your spirit to turn from our ways and walk with Jesus wherever he lives. Hear this assurance of pardon. I am the light of the world, Jesus proclaimed. The people who sat in darkness have seen this great light. When we come to the light in repentance, we are restored and forgiven. Walk now as the children of the light. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now would you share in the peace of Christ with your neighbors. I invite all the children to come up here for some moments with children. While they're gathering, um, some quick announcements. There is no youth concert tonight um, that was postponed, canceled rather. We did not have enough interest in it to go. We will be making chocolates next week in youth. Come on, guys, have a See, I should say girls and gentlemen, actually. I always say guys. How are you this morning? Well, let's see if everybody knows what this is. What is this? What? A phone, yeah. Has anybody ever gotten a phone call before from anyone? No? Well, when we answer the phone, right, somebody is calling and asking to speak to us, right? Or maybe they're inviting us somewhere, right? Now, nowadays we can even get text messages and things like that, right? Now, that is what call, call means to us today. Somebody is calling. When Jesus was around, an invitation for people to come was called a call. And Jesus called his followers, to follow him. He called people. He said, come, follow me. Now, I'm going to pass these out. Take a look at him. Take a look. Now, I don't know how well you can, can see the copy I made there, but if you don't know what they are, those are invitations. One of them is to a birthday party. One of them is to a holiday party. And one of them is to a wedding. Everyone's different. Have any of you ever gotten a birthday, an invitation to a party before, your friend's birthday or anything? You're nodding your head, right? That's right. And they're inviting you to come and be with them, right? That's what an invitation is. Well, in today's story, Jesus calls his followers and he says, come be with me. Come and follow me. Now, 
one of his followers, Peter, doesn't feel like he's good enough. I don't know if you've ever been invited somewhere before and you don't feel like you're dressed right or, or maybe you don't have the right birthday present or anything to give, right? So you don't want to come. You're, maybe you're scared to come. That's the way Peter was. And Jesus said, come, follow me. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to come. Come, follow me. I will make you a fisher of men. And then the second group of people that Jesus invited, they were busy. Have you ever been really busy doing something? Maybe with your schoolwork, your homework, or an activity, right? And then somebody calls or interrupts or something. Well, these guys were fishing with their dad in a boat. And Jesus gave them one of those invitations. He said, come, follow me, right in the middle of their life. And they were busy. So they had a decision to make. They had to decide whether they were going to accept Jesus' invitation. But they did. It says that they left their dad in the boat and everything, and they followed Jesus. And see, today, God invites us to his party in heaven to be with him. And Jesus is the one inviting us to follow him and be with God in heaven. So, that is God's invitation to us. As his children, he wants us to come be with him in heaven, and Jesus wants us to follow him. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for inviting me to be with you. Help me to follow Jesus. Amen. You are dismissed to Children's Church. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thank Let's you, Tim. Go. It's good to see the little ones up there. As we prepare for our time of prayer today, I, I place on the altar the prayer concerns that those of you that are gathered in the centrum have written uh, as you came in. Uh, those of you that are joining on, online, if you'd like to share your prayer concerns, we do invite you to share them through the chat feature on Facebook, and then we'll add them to our list, which will go out this week, so that we can be in prayer for one another. We know we've again faced uh, tragedies in our, our world today, as there was again another shooting I hear. I, I didn't see it this morning. And so that again, of course, is heavy on our hearts as our country still wrestles uh, with acts, senseless acts of violence. We also know there are members of our community that have been in the hospital. Some have had some surgeries. They're recovering well. I've been gone on vacation for weeks. I'm kind of catching up on a lot of the news here on what's happening within our community. Uh, we also have two flowers on our altar recognizing members who had, had passed away. Uh, I've been in touch with Miss Beery's family, and uh, I still call her Mrs. Beery. She was an English teacher when I was in high school. She always told me to call her Libby, and I wrestle with that because she was always Mrs. Beery to me. Uh, but we hope to have a service for her in the coming weeks, uh, though she had passed away a while before. But now, my sisters and brothers, let us open our hearts and our spirits to God's presence as we go to this time of prayer and through the, the chorus and as I light our prayer candle. God of 
mercy, grace, and love. You call to us and inviting us, the scattered people, to, to come home into your loving presence, to come and gather before you, bringing all that we are, all that we would choose not to be, bringing them before you so that your grace and mercy might pour down upon us, forgiving us of those things that we've done, those things we've left undone, those times in which we've failed to live up to your high calling upon our hearts. For as we remember this day, Lord, you walk along the seashores, the byways, and the highways, calling to people to come and to follow you, to come and follow your light into this world of darkness, following and allowing that light that shines in you to shine in us, shining so that all people might know your grace. We pray for that light to shine among the needs among us, our friends and family who are wrestling with illness, those in the hospitals, those recovering from surgeries. We pray that your light of comfort and grace would fall upon all who mourn. And we pray that your light of beauty might shine upon our world. For indeed, Lord, you've called us to be light in the darkness. And when we encounter again acts of senseless violence in our cities and our communities, we know how much we need that light to shine. So, oh God, shine your light upon us. Call us and help us to follow you, to follow your light, so that we can join you in bringing the redemption to this world by sharing your good news with all whom we meet, so that again there would be no need for these things and violence. For we would be your people, the people living and loving within your light, fellow followers of our Lord. And we ask these things today, O oh God, in his name, this Jesus the Christ, as we share the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
The Old Testament lesson is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. But there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Prepare to share our uh, gospel lesson. I want to let you know I'm going to be starting a series here this week. We're we're in the season of Epiphany. Sometimes it's called just ordinary time, meaning we we count the Sundays. But it's also a season in which we remember this light of the Lord shining upon us and among us. So during these next few weeks, we will be sharing around following the light and and living in the light. But we begin our journey in this season of light with this text. And I invite you to stand as I share it with you. It comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 12 to 23. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. So that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called to them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated, and we pray for wherever those sirens are heading. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, as we gather in your house this day and across through the airwaves and through the internet, I pray that your spirit would be among us, and that as always, these words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, that they might be acceptable in your sight. For you ever and always are our light, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Dustin Snyder had had enough. He was tired of the long work weeks, the low wages, and even the grumpy customers. He was an assistant manager at McDonald's restaurant in Bradford, Pennsylvania. But in early September 21, he drafted a a petition to the regional office And he invited his co-workers to sign it. He said, we're all leaving and hope you find employees that want to work for $9.25 an hour. And nearly all 24 of the day shift employees signed the petitions with him. It wasn't wasn't a strike and it it wasn't really a protest, but to Dustin and his low-wage employees, it was simply a, a statement of fact. And so Dayton, Dustin I mean, faxed the petition to the regional office in Buffalo. 
And then moments later, of course, his phone rang. It was the regional supervisor. Why did you do it? She wanted to know. And he said, well, I'm just trying to get better pay for my people. Or there are better ways to go about this, he was chided by the supervisor. No one gets a raise, she said. If your workers don't like it, they can quit. And so they did. Nearly every single one of them right there on the spot, they took off their headsets, they abandoned their stations in the drive through and the cash registers, and the line at the drive through began to get longer and longer and longer. Mystified employees watched customers uh, congregate in the parking lot, and they, they watched Dustin lock the building, and he hung a sign on the door. He scrabbed in a, a blue highlighter, the only pen he could find. Due to lack of pay, we all quit. And some guy from the line said, hey, man, we just want a quarter pounder and fries. And he said, well, we just want to be paid more and treated better. When he told the other assistant manager, she agreed. And so the night shift did the same thing. And they all began texting and all that stuff. Now, this walkout at this McDonald's wasn't necessarily a, a labor action. They, it wasn't an act of collective bargaining. You know, they're not a union or anything. And it wasn't planned in advance. I mean, it was just a handwritten note with a blue highlighter to let folks know. But it's something we've been encountering in our world today post-COVID. It's called the Great Resignation. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, thousands of people and workers across America, professionals as well as shift workers, they begin rethinking the work that they do and, and why do they do it and what does it mean to be a worker. And they, many have decided to walk away from their previous jobs, some to new jobs, others to no jobs at all. And I was thinking a little bit about that this week because though it's different in nature, today's gospel lesson talks about some people who walked away from their jobs. They leave them. And they leave them not for more pay, but they leave them for a higher calling. They leave their jobs, and yes, some of them even leave their families. And they do so to follow the light of hope. The light of hope that was shining in this Jesus. They walk away to change their lives, just not not just by seeking new employment, but by leaving it all behind to, to pursue something new. And unlike what many businesses are experiencing in our world today, this resignation is about a lot more than just changing jobs. It's more like swapping one life for another. You know, writers and commentators have often wondered whether the disciples really knew who Jesus was before he came walking along the beach that day. They may have, of course. Rabbis were known and you know, it's not really clear whether Jesus was doing a whole lot of healing or teaching yet. It doesn't seem that way. But our lesson does tell us that when John was arrested, Jesus decided to get out of Dodge and leave the area. And so he leaves Jerusalem and he goes up to Galilee. And when he gets home, he even leaves his hometown of Nazareth and he goes over to the commercial city of Capernaum there on the Sea of Galilee. And it's there we're told he begins preaching his message of repentance. Again, this is much like what John was doing, but there's a twist. For whereas John was preaching a call to repentance in preparation for something that was to come, Jesus' call to repentance was about something that was already here. Repent, the kingdom of God has come near, he said. Turn from the old, for now the new has come. Leave behind your old ways and walk in a new way. And then as he's walking along the shore, he sees these fishermen and they're, they're hard at work and their labors. And he says to them, come, follow me. Come follow me into a new way of making a living. Leave your nets and come follow me into this new way of life. Come follow me, he says. Come follow me, the, the light of the world. The one who has come to burn off the darkness of sorrow and sin and death. 
Come follow the one who has come into this land of darkness to show a new way. Come, come follow me, the one who will lead you into fishing for people, rather than just these smelly fish on the shoreline. Come, follow me, he said. Did they know what they were getting into? Probably not. But like those McDonald's workers in Bradford, they knew this call and following it had to be much better from where they were. Because following the light had to be better than living in darkness. And in these humble men's actions, we see the beginning of the Christian church and the Christian faith. You know, I'm not a real big fan of of saying who's a disciple of Christ and who is not. I mean, Lord knows I'm the last person qualified to, to be a gatekeeper about who's allowed to use that term or who's in or who's out. But, you know, in recent years, there's some friends of mine and others who have been suggesting we stop using that term Christian disciple altogether. And they say that because, you know, it's got some baggage tied to it, sort of. And it's kind of insider language. I mean, what do we mean when we say disciple? How do we define it? You know, in our culture today, we usually don't use that term except for people that are involved in some kind of crazy cult. And though disciple is a beautiful term, and I, and I understand it because I've grown up in the faith and it's part of our tradition, I'm beginning to think the term Jesus follower is more helpful. The Jesus follower is a more helpful term to interject into our conversation. While a disciple can mean many different things, I mean, you can be a a disciple of a certain school of economics, you can be a, a disciple of a past president. A Jesus follower, Jesus follower, for me, is more definable because it's a person who's living a life that follows Jesus. One who's seeking to follow in the way of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I long to be a Jesus follower. It's what I strive for. It's it's what I want to be when I grow up. Because that's what this Christian movement is all about. And whereas it's not always easy to say who is a Christian and who is not. I believe Jesus' followers are observable. One doesn't need to tell you they're a Jesus follower because you'll be able to see it by how they live. As I look at the Jesus we find in this New Testament, I began to think about what are some of those hallmarks of what it looks like to follow him. What What are the traits that can be observed that you can say, yep, That's a Jesus follower over there. I believe that a Jesus follower likes to talk about Jesus. But does so in such a way that it causes you to want to know more. Not less. A Jesus follower is one who who seeks always to embrace and love one's enemy. Though it's hard to do. A Jesus follower is one who is full of compassions to outsiders and for those who are weak. A Jesus follower is one who is quick to show mercy. A Jesus follower is the one who, when they describe what God is like, begins to talk about Jesus. You see, in this text today, we have Jesus choosing those first followers. People like you, people like me, men who worked hard in their profession, but now they're hearing a call and they decide to leave the old behind and step out to follow this new light that was shining in their midst. Perhaps for the first time they had been recognized and called to be someone called to something bigger than fishing and mending nets, called to something new where they were valued as a people and allowed to fulfill not only their dreams, but to live into God's dream for the world. You know, I read a story the other day about a little boy who went to lunch with his mom and a couple of their friends. They, they went to a diner. 
the waitress, I kind of picture her being Flo, you know, with her little pad, came over to, to talk to them and ask them what they wanted. And the two ladies gave their order. And then she looked at the little boy and said, so what do you want? And mom and the other lady spoke up immediately. And she said, no, no, what do you want? And she worked till the boy could give her the order and wrote it down. And then she turned around and she hollered back at the cook in the kitchen with his order. And the little boy immediately turned to his mom and says, Mommy, Mommy, she thinks I'm real. When Jesus called those men to follow him on that shore that day, he acknowledged that they were real and that they were important. And not only that, but that they had a role. They had a role in God's plan. And you know, the same is true for you and the same is true for me. The same is true for all of us. For just as Jesus walked along the shore calling men to drop their nets and follow him in his way of light and love, so too does he walk the highways and byways of our world calling us, calling out to us to follow him and his light into the darkness of our world. Calling, saying, follow me. Come, be my follower. Now, we may question why God is calling us. I mean, why do we think God would choose us? But as we shared a few weeks ago on baptism of our Lord Sunday, it's ultimately because God loves you and God wants to know you. God called you to Christ for the same reason that he called those original followers because you make an excellent example of an object lesson about the power and the mercy of God. He calls you with your rebellious heart. He calls you with your secret struggles. You with your lack of faith and that long list of faults. He calls us even though deep down we know we are unworthy to tie God's shoes, let alone be God's child. But the thing is, God chooses us. And he chooses us so that the world might look at us and see that God is indescribably merciful and that our God is incredibly powerful. My friends, we're all invited to be God's followers in Christ and to be followers of Jesus. He invites us to follow the light. We recognize we've been given something we don't deserve but desperately need, that love of God that's found in Christ Jesus. And our task each day is to see this life with Jesus as an undeserved invitation but it's an undeserved invitation that it calls us to drop our plans and then to follow him wherever he leads, knowing and trusting that wherever he takes us is better and more beautiful than anything we would have planned ourselves. Is it easy? No. It wasn't easy for those first followers either. It's not always comfortable to follow the light, but Simon Peter took that first step. It's not always comfortable to follow the light, but, but Martha, the sister of Mary, took that first step. It, it's not easy to follow that light, but Stephen, the first martyr, took that step. It, it's not easy to follow that light, but, but St. Augustine took the step. And so did Joan of Arc and, and Martin Luther when he went and pounded those theses on the door. And John and Charles Wesley took that first step. As did Sojourner Truth, and as we remembered this week, so too did Dr. Martin Luther King. They took that step. And we too are called to be followers of Christ. But as we follow, there are questions we must ask ourselves. One we ask is, am I following close enough to hear the flap of his sandal? Am I following him and his path of love and justice? Am I walking in his light? Because you see, when we choose to be followers of this Jesus, sometimes we have to make choices that 
may cause ourselves or maybe even our families hardship. There are times in our lives as followers and we'll have to decide to risk our reputation on behalf of another. There will be times in our lives as a follower where we'll have to to walk away from the world's standard of success because it requires a piece of our souls. There are times when our lives as a follower when we'll have to open up our hearts and give our trust knowing all too well that our hearts might be broken in doing so. And instead of tying us to this ever-spiraling clamor on the world's ladder of success, when Jesus calls us to the light, he invites us to follow him to be a light in this dark world. And it takes all of our lives. But just like those first followers, when he does so, Jesus offers us a purpose. And Jesus offers us a service to be lived out. God offers us, Jesus offers us God's pleasure. Jesus offers us God's peace. And in it, Jesus offers us love and redemption. And indeed, these are the joys of being a follower of this Jesus knowing that we've been called to help catch the lost and proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God as he did. So when Jesus calls me tomorrow morning to love my annoying neighbor, I'll see it as a gift, a gift of grace and a chance for God's power to shine in the darkness and through my weakness. Because after all, I'm not always the best at loving unlovable people. And when Jesus calls us to invite a co-worker to church, we can see that it's a gift of grace. And a chance for God's power to shine in our weakness. It isn't easy to believe in God's goodness, in the triumph of Christ when a chemo pump is pumping through your veins. But in every opportunity in this life, as a follower of the light, as a follower with Jesus, we're invited to follow him so that the world can watch and see this extraordinary thing happen in just ordinary people, unschooled and undeserving. People like you, people like me, as they seek to live out to be an example of God's mercy and power. God did not have to choose us, but God did. He has chosen us. God doesn't have to use us, but God has chosen to use us anyway. And the thing is, the end result is not just a blessing for us and a blessing to those whom we touch, The end result is the glory of God's name and God's name alone as we choose to be Jesus followers trying to get close enough that we can see the dust of his shoes. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh God, we want to follow this Jesus. We want to follow his light. We want to be those who receive and emanate that same light in our world today. For Lord knows our world is full of such darkness. Darkness that calls people to perform senseless acts of violence. Darkness that calls people to push others to the side. But oh God, as we seek to follow Jesus, may we begin to see his light shine, shine in us and shine in others such that all may know your love and this community called the kingdom of God may more fully come into our world. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I now invite you as we share in our tithes and our offerings, I remind you that your gifts to our church go to help that light shine in our world. 
shining and programs that bring little kids together around a court to play and to know one another. The light that shines as folks learn more about God and a light that shines as we reach out to meet the needs of our neighbors. We thank you for your gifts and may you know that they will truly touch lives as we seek to be Jesus followers here at Christ Church. Thank you. As we prepare for our closing hymn, as always, these knee pads out here aren't just for me. If you want to come up, you're invited. But let us sing the summer.
Now may the love and grace of God in Christ surround you and all of us as we step out seeking to be followers of the light, walking close behind our Lord such that we can see the dust of his footsteps and sharing that light he's given us with all whom we meet. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.